Hardscrabble rural life, love, veterans, and racism are tackled with grace and pathos in an original Vermont opera. Collaborators in A Fleeting Animal, an opera from Jew Divine, join me next on Connect. Hi, I'm Fran Stoddard. The stage play Jude Divine, written by poet, playwright, and musician David Budbill, has had a 30-plus year history of success with over 65 per performances around the U.S. In 2000, composer Eric Nielsen premiered his opera based on that play in collaboration with Budbill to great acclaim. The opera will be restaged this month with single night performances across the state. I welcome these two lauded and very accomplished artists to uh, this, thanks, this place. It's great to be, have you both here. Oh, thanks for having us. So, um, e Eric, first, why did you choose David's, you know, this incredible work, um, but still it's a, it's a major work to, you know, basically have as a big part of your life for a while. To, creating an opera is not an easy thing. So why did you choose Jude Divine? Well, when Vermont Opera Theater commissioned me to write an opera, I felt very strongly that I wanted it to be a Vermont story. Um, there weren't any Vermont operas or operas about Vermont that I was aware of. And so I looked through a number of texts and I kept coming back to Jew Divine. And it kept speaking to me and I finally said, okay, I, I know this guy by reputation, I've never met him, I'm just going to take the bull by the horns. And so I called him up and I said, to him, uh, hi, I'm Eric Nielsen, I'm a composer, and I really admire Jew Divine. I've been commissioned to write an <laughs> opera, and has anyone ever made an opera before based on, on your play? And number two, if not, are you interested in collaborating with me? And he said no to the first question and yes to the second. <laughs> <laughs> so David, clearly the, the themes and stories from Jew Divine have resonated for you know, three decades. Right. What are your thoughts about that success and the longevity of what you wrote? Well, I don't know if I have any thoughts. Um, I do think that um, the, 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 the play does have a lasting, it's been produced yeah. all over the country in dozens and dozens of uh, productions. and. It seems to appeal to people. It does. It's the it's the characters, and I mean, there's a lot going on. And actually, we have some footage from Crossroads, uh, tw 29 years ago, of you and uh, and the cast doing a little bit from that, which goes back to Rusty Dewey's one of his first parts at age 24 right, or something. Right. Let's take a look. It's an imaginary place full of imaginary people, um, but some of those people look very much like people in the real world because in some way they are similar to them. We are always here and always leaving, like the river just passing through. And we endure year after year, season after season, waiting out the winter, waiting always for the spring. Ah, spring. Light hovers longer in the southern sky. Brooks uncover themselves. Alders redden. Grosbeak's beaks turn green. Chickadee finds the song she lost last November. Earth softens to the touch. Buds stand up like nipples. The, the geese, geese return. return. Their long bees plow the fields of cloud. The trees loud again with birds. So spring is, of course, one of the lighter moments in, right. in Jude Divine um, and in an opera. And we're going to get to this because there's some very tough issues. There's, there's poverty and uh, race and PTSD and, and veterans that, that come into it. But I, I was so, it was so great that we got some rehearsal footage and some of it was some blocking of spring. So we'll talk over this, but let's take a look at that and how this has shifted to opera from a play. So Eric, talk a little bit about how, how the staging is different from for an opera. Well, part of that depends on what the stage director decides to do. So this staging, for instance, is, is quite a bit different from the original production, mm -hmm. which is fine. Um, I think, though, that um, for me, I had to envision something when I was writing the music. And mm -hmm. even if it isn't realized exactly how, how I thought of it, 
um, it's it's a collaborative process. And so, uh, <laughs> for me, being a kind of a an anal, you know, controlling guy, I had to let go a lot. You know, I had huh. I wrote a lot of stage directions, and David said, "Don't do that." <laughs> I said, "The director's <laughs> going to ignore those anyway." He said, right. "Get rid of a lot of that stuff." So right. I did. Um, so it was a big learning process, and it continues to be a learning process for me. But I did have to envision what those words connoted, what they meant to come up with a character for the music to sure. make it seem suitable. Otherwise, why not just speak the lines? Right. Right. Well, I. Uh, so that that gets. Uh, I'm going to get back to how you musically create character, because I, I think that that's um, really essential. I, but I want to go to David um, here about wh there are parts of Jude Divine that were chosen for this. What were what were the parts that were really rich? Were you a part of that choosing of about what parts of the play yeah. actually became the yeah. opera? Yeah, we we settled on Tommy and Grace because they're so operatic. I mean, my friend, um, um, Catherine. Catherine Williams, uh, Catherine Patterson, Patterson says, oh, love her. Um, you go to the opera and you sit there until everybody's dead and then you go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's not quite that bad in True Divine, but, uh, or in The Fleeting Animal, but um, it is, I mean, the main main characters, two of them, one goes crazy and one kills himself. Yeah. So, um, and we picked that particular story because it was so operatic. Right, great. And, and so, coming back to you and what you're speaking of, how does opera serve that story and these characters? What do you, what, what do you, are you thinking about, about? Well, is it a soprano, is it a, a right, you know, exactly. all of there, these? There, there are a lot of things. Uh, one of the reasons that we chose these characters and the surrounding ones, including the townspeople, because the town is, in some sense, is the main character mm. in this, um, about their endurance and about living in small town, rural, northern New England. Um, I had to somehow try to enter into these people's lives. And what I've been telling people is these people walk right off a back road and onto the stage. That's how rich and, and mm -hmm. how alive these characters are. So David made my job actually easier because the things that they said um, jumped out at me as crying to be set to music. And so I, I tried very hard to envision well, how does Tommy sound? What, what is his character that I can set in music? And even though he's very troubled when he comes back from Vietnam, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, he's cool. He's a stud. You see that yeah. very much in the softball scene. And so when he first shows up after his scene in Vietnam, it's very jazzy sounding. Mm. And it's because he's cool. Now, part of the reason he's cool, and I've only sort of thought of this in retrospect, is because he's become urbanized when he was in Vietnam. Oh. He met a lot of other people from different cultures, different races, who are serving with him. And we see two of them later. And so he's, he's kind of a foreign person when he comes back to yeah. a lot of the people yeah. in, in, in his hometown. And right. so they, they so spread out a little different. bit. his voice is different than theirs. His voice yeah. is Has very different. Has become different. different. Yes. Very, very different. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of him being, you know, the, the Difficulties of a returning veteran are are covered in this. Um, PTSD plays a significant role, and it was interesting when I thought about it. The PTSD diagnosis wasn't even a diagnosis no, when you first wrote this play, right. um, right. and and vets are now returning from a different war. This is very enduring. What is the reaction of veterans to this play over the years? We yeah. don't know. Um, we're going to find out. Um, I think that um, they will be touched by it. Yeah. I hope they are. Do you expect people, so you're, you're also talking about people who are often um, have, have a rough life, they right. live in the country, yeah. um, are they coming, are they going to come to your opera? Do you expect that to be a part of your audience? We hope so. I hope so. We hope so. I mean, yeah. we're working to get everywhere to talk to everybody we can about this show. Uh, we've reached out to veteran support organizations. 
Um, we're, we're, we will have subsidized tickets available for veterans and their spouses or their friends so that they can come. We're having talk back sessions after each performance that will have clinicians at them so that people can see and can feel that they're in a safe place to either talk about or experience this with the larger community. For a lot of veterans, isolation is the biggest problem I've learned, and I keep learning more about this all the time. And that's a big part of the play. David, yeah. do you have a thought? Well, I had one conversation with a vet, and he said he liked this play because it was honest. It didn't pussyfoot around about suicide. It didn't pussyfoot around about any of those things that um, Poverty, yes. dealing with money. Right, right. What, what do you do when you come back? Right. All, all of those, all of those powerful so, issues. Um, I'm hoping they'll, they'll find it touching. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure they will. And, and what's the, what's the takeaway for a general audience? What do, you, what do you hope they take away? From I hope they're in tears at the end. I mean, mm -hmm. I hope yeah, me that, too. I hope that they are moved. That they laugh. Mm -hmm. um, with knowledge when, when people are talking about how long winter is and how brief spring is and how you have to squeeze a million things into summer and how beautiful the color is in fall, that they, mm. they see commonality with the people on stage and that they are so pulled into their stories that as I saw in audience's face at the end of the, the first run that people were there and they were transfixed. And one of David's friends wrote him afterwards and said, we cried all afternoon. It was wonderful. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's the experience awesome. I would necessarily <laughs> right. have, but, but I've been talking to groups, David and I mm. have been talking to groups, and there's a lot of interest. Yeah. There's a lot of interest out there. The story is gripping, and some of it is funny, and some of it is sad, but it's like life, and there's a lot for people to, to find yeah, in common. I'm just trying it. to make a whole portrait of a group of people, not just one part. Right. Right, and the opera does focus on some people, and yours was a in Jude Divine. It's a whole community, yeah. but there's still is a, there's a lot addressed in this. Actually, we have um, another uh, clip from a rehearsal, um, and I, I think this is Antoine and Doug. It is Antoine and Doug, and it's supposed to be Edith, but she was away, so there's a stand-in for her. Okay. So you Authority on what is right to ancient Edith. Uh, uh, why don't you figure out something else to do with all your extra spare time? Yes, Edith. Why? Okay, don't this is powerful. And they're doing this great blocking. Save us all and learn to stay. So, this is pretty. Um, intense stuff for people who are going to do this over, what, two weekends. We, we just saw right. the schedule. Yep. Um, six productions. Six productions all over the state, one night for each, each one. It's, it's kind of both wonderful and tragically brief. But, well, this um, is what we can is, do. Are, are, there, are there discussions after each one? Yes. Great. Yes, there are. And is that new? Did, I don't remember that happening at, when no, no, you when you no. staged this before. No, no. It's the thing that our board of wonderful volunteers um, said at our very first meeting, which was in May of 2014, mm -hmm. was how much more relevant all the themes were this yeah. time than they were 15 years ago. And well, so they wanted to reach out. They wanted to do more. So we have a documentary being made by mm -hmm. Susan Bettman about the making of this. We have two art shows mm -hmm. that deal with the themes in the opera and they are in the lower gallery at Chandler um, where the final performance will be and at the Barry Opera House where the first performance will be and that includes art and poetry by David and others and several veterans have their art in the show as well so we're trying to make this a more comprehensive production because the issues are even more present than they were when it was done first. So I, I read that why are these issues more relevant today than they were 15 years ago? <laughs> it's a good question. I wish there have been they three weren't. wars instead of one. Okay. That's one reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a and actually, another another is, is racism. David, this has all yeah. always been an issue, very very dear to your heart yeah. and Im important to you, um, especially. In, and you live in the whitest state in the nation. I do. But uh, you have never let this um, this issue go. How is it addressed in the opera? Well, um, I wrote a piece for 
I think it was called Seven Days back then, when it, and it was called Hiding Out in Honky Heaven. <laughs> and that's the way I feel about living here. And so these, one of the things I was able to do when I um, got this commission from Eric was open up the opera and include two black guys. That weren't in the original play. They are not yeah. in the original play. They are now, but they weren't. So originally. that's significant. They, these are these are two uh, war buddies, yeah. right. right? Right. James and William, and yeah. they're and they bring great. jazz see, they, to they, them. They, 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 they don't. They didn't even. Um, they didn't exist in Tommy's world until he went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. right. So in, in lots of ways, Vietnam is a opening up for Tommy. Right. Right. And. Now, how, in developing a character for a play, does the impulse start with people that you knew or with an idea that you reveal a character through it? Well, it all depends on the person. Some of these characters are based on people I know. Um, others of the characters, well, for example, Grace. Um, my wife used, is an artist and she came home one day from teaching art at CCV and she said we were on a smoke break and this one person said oh it's five o'clock I gotta go my, 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 my boyfriend calls me every day at this time on his mobile phone when he's in his limousine well <laughs> <laughs> my wife took it in as, as gospel I said no way that that girl has a boyfriend with a limousine. And that's how the whole wow. Grace thing stories, started. Stories that, that started. people tell. So Eric, back to you, just how this collaboration works. How do you approach issues? War, PTSD, poverty, race. Um, how do they affect the music, the, the character musically? I mean, this is a, the surround. You've, you've got your character that you have chosen has a certain tone. How do you how do you bring the music to these issues, or vice versa? Well, a lot of it is in the characters and in the lines already. All I have to do, all I have to do, is try to, as much as possible, be true musically to how these people are feeling, how they are responding, so that when Tommy lights into Doug for his racist remarks, mm. um, He's lighting into him, into him to try and enlighten him about how the difficulty is not race, it's class, and that Doug is in the same boat with Tommy and his two buddies from Vietnam, right. that they're all being kept down by employers. And so I had to try and make the music driving and show his, his really righteous anger about right. this issue. And so it, it had to be very direct and very um, rhythmically intense. Uh, likewise, when they are singing about how beautiful it is in the evening in the summer, I, I mm. try to just open that up and make it as lyrical as possible, but at the same time retain a sense of swing because Tommy and William and James are all singing. And so I had to keep the character in there, but within that sort of musical character, I had to make it open up and be as well as beautiful as I knew how to make it because it's the it's the most beautiful s um, set of lines in the whole opera for me, and so I had to try and express that. So a rich tapestry it, to it work is, with. It is. Oh yeah. my goodness! That's one of the reasons that I fell in love with this is because it's it gave me so much to work with. Well, so there's another scene that we have also from the rehearsal. I think this was even from an iPhone. It's really great that that people have iPhones, and um, I believe Grace is just she's putting up her laundry and she's pissed off. Do you want to say anything else about this scene? Well, she's she is talking Frustrated. about her life and how she's working six days a week and, and then all she has time to do is just do a little work around the house or fix their car which is falling apart and everything. And what does she get for this? She gets town gossip that says that she's a slut and that she's no good and that she beats her kids and everything mm. and nobody understands her and she's angry. Yeah, she is. Here we go. And on Sundays we get to work around the place, you know, bring in the water, fix the goddamn Since her husband left, I'm sorry, given the full time job, and her 
How much blocking did you do for the opera? I mean, is it fully blocked, or is it mainly about the music for such a... Well, I mean, I didn't include any of this with, you know, clothesline or anything. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, this is Margo Whitcomb's doing. She's our stage director, and she has been wonderful. I mean, she's just dived into this. So it is, it is a full, full out production. Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. So we're both going to our first rehearsal tonight when we're actually sitting in. So that's great. I know that I personally wanted to give them enough chance to get a little bit comfortable right. so that they could um, not feel at. One thing I've discovered over the years is even though a lot of people know me as Eric, once I show up in that rehearsal, I'm suddenly, in solid caps, the composer. Right. And, right. and they get right. nervous suddenly. And, I keep trying and to say, right. Yeah, in this case, it's the composer and, and the, the playwright. playwright. Oh, my goodness. You know, so. Um, speaking of, so you have these two black guys that um, you were able to, and, and th but they're not from here. No, but they've both performed in, in Vermont before, and so that's, Great. we got connections through Vermont organizations that had hired them before. So we have Johnny Lee. Green, who's from New York City, and he's playing James. And we have Thomas Beard from Baltimore, and he's playing William. And uh, I think they're going to be wonderful. And the thing about James and William that I love is that they are not two peas in a pod. They are fully developed characters. Yeah, they just happen very to be different from each other. They right, just happen to be right. African American, but you right. know, James is very sweet and naive, and he falls in love with Vermont. And William's got a harder edge to him, and he keeps saying, you know, you think you'll like it up here, but wait until they shoot out your windows. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason I bring it up is also, for some of these people, the rehearsal time is very short. Mm -hmm. Right. But they've been working on this probably for yes. a very long time. As you have, you actually had a, uh, an online fundraising for this, and you've had a board of directors. Right. And so, so just tell us about h how, did how did that work for you? I mean, obviously, you are putting this up. but. It, that must have been challenging. It's been a lot of work. I mean, the online fundraiser was for me to take the original score, which is handwritten, put it into my computer software, and it took me about 14 months, um, and then revise it. I mean, it's a two-hour opera. Um, but in terms of raising money for the production itself, we're, we've been very fortunate to have as our co-producer and fiscal agent the Monteverdi School in Montpelier. They've given us rehearsal space. They've been just mm. fabulous in all of this. And so they have been receiving the contributions, and we've gotten contributions from individuals, sometimes two or three times, from mm. businesses. We've gotten several grants, and so we've been working really hard for about the last 15 months on this, you know, pedaling as fast as we can. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's just make sure that people know when, when this is. It starts on the 11th. Yes. Uh, Barry Opera House is the first performance on September 11th, and then the 12th it will be here in Colchester, across right. the street at the Ellie Long Center. Yeah. And then Sunday afternoon, the 13th, it will be at the Hardwick Town House. And then the second weekend, Friday the 18th, will be yeah. at the Woodstock Town Hall Theater. You have Saturday. these all memorized, oh, well, don't do. you? <laughs> that they're up there in Virgins. Saturday Jens. for Jens, and then the final performance will be, as was the case the first time the opera was done, at Chandler Center in Randolph. Exciting. Um, again, about the collaboration, David, you're a musician. Did uh, did you have any say about the music, or did you discuss how the music would work, or did you stay completely out of that? I stayed completely out of it. <laughs> that was that hard. No. No. <laughs> and and did you stay out of the libretto, or no? Nah. <laughs> because he would say David was wonderful about this. I mean, for one thing, as a jazz guy, he's used to improvising. So he would send me text. He did a lot to regularize the the. Uh, stresses to make it easier to be set to music, but he would send me, you know, whole scenes from Beautiful. Go back. What do you mean regular law? Regularize. Uh, the, how, what does that mean? How well, do you do, it how means do you do that? turning a non-iambic line into an iambic mm -hmm. line, basically. Right. So it would wor so work within. Ba -doom, ba -doom, ba -doom. Yeah, and right. it's, it would work with music. Yeah, and it's not so you know, it's it's not so obvious as that, but it was it made it much easier for me to work with it, but. Yeah. If it takes 10 seconds to say a line, it takes a minute and a half to sing it. And so right. I didn't need as many words as there were. Sure. And so I would say, okay, a little less of this, a little more of that. And I'd say to him, for instance, because we had new characters, I said, can you give me something? I'd always wanted to do this. You know, if you watch a Mozart opera, there are four, five, six people singing at the same time. 
and, uh, but different things. And so I said, I want a quartet with James and William and, and, and Tommy and Grace. And so he gave me these lines and they were great. That's, and, and only, you know, probably a poet can, can really handle that pretty well. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me briefly about the documentary. What is, what is its focus? Is it just um, he, a document of the, of the opera itself, or is it much more than that? Well, it's both. It, it interviews us, it, it takes some rehearsal footage, and then it's also going to be um, filming an entire performance of the, mm. of the opera. So it's both things, and both background and the show. Susan Bettman is the filmmaker. Great. So interviews and a lot of an interspersing. Thank you both. David You're Budbill, welcome. fabulous poet, playwright, of course, and musician, and Eric Nielsen for putting together this opera called A Fleeting Animal um, from Jude Devine. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And a reminder that we'd like to connect with you and keep the conversation going. To reach out with feedback and ideas or to check out other episodes and extras with these guys, just go to connect at vermontpbs.org. Thanks a lot. See you next time.